just because you're holding dumbbells and a barbell or you're doing resistance training exercises doesn't mean you're doing resistance training. I can, you know, circuit training, orange theory, that's cardio with dumbbells. It's cardio with weights. It's going from one exercise to another, no rest, you know, really breathing hard. It's like you're running. It's really no, it's really no different, maybe slightly different, but it's really no different. To reap the real benefits of resistance training, you got to train like you're building strength. Today's episode is with Sal Stefano. Sal is the co-founder of Mind Pump Media and co-host of Mind Pump, an online radio show and podcast that is dedicated to providing truthful fitness and health information. Sal is dedicated to prioritizing health over appearance, and he aims to shift the direction of the fitness industry from aesthetic and insecurity-based to one that's based in self-love and self-care. So I'm excited to have Sal on the podcast today to chat about all things resistance training. A few of the topics we'll be discussing today include why resistance training produces more permanent results compared to other forms of exercise, why relying on cardio to change your body composition is a huge mistake, how resistance training directly encourages youthful hormone levels, and much more. So let's get into this episode with Sal Stefano. Welcome back to Metflex and Chill. This is your host, Rachel Gregory, and I'm here with Sal Stefano. How are you, Sal? I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited you're here. Um, I'm really excited to dive into your new book. Um, I want to ask you some questions related to that. We also have a bunch of listener questions that I want to get into. Um, but before we do that, do you want to just give a little bit of background on kind of, you know, if if listeners don't know who you are, like how you got into the nutrition fitness industry and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I, I developed a passion for fitness and nutrition or health uh, at an early age. I was 14 when I really got into it and just fell in love with it. By the time I was 18, I became a personal trainer um, shortly after became a gym manager. So I managed big, big box fitness clubs and grand open some of these gyms. And by the time I was 22, I went off and ventured on my own, opened up a wellness studio that had personal training and massage therapy. We had hormone testing and gut testing in there and acupuncture. And I did that for a long time and I loved it and I worked with people and it was a, a, just a great, great time. And about seven years ago or so, um, I started uh, Mind Pump Media with my partners, Adam, Justin, and Doug who you hear on our podcast, the Mind Pump podcast. And the podcast and the media company's goal was really to shift the direction of popular fitness media. Popular fitness media so driven by appearance and uh, you know, sex appeal and preying on people's insecurities and selling you know, false promises. And us as all trainers, all of us had worked in the fitness industry, except for maybe Doug, we all really hated that. We hated the false lies. I mean, we worked with people on an everyday basis and we trained people for years and we had to correct all these things and help people do things the right way. And so we created the, the media company to kind of fight fire with fire. Let's get the right information out there. Let's make it entertaining and let's see if we can make a difference. And so for the last seven years, uh, that's what I've been doing. I've been hosting the podcast and helping putting together our YouTube content or video content or blogs. And then, of course, more recently, I published uh, The Resistance Training Revolution, which is a book on resistance training. Awesome. Love it. Yeah. I mean, I have listened to your podcast for many, many years and love. I feel like I've never had an episode that I didn't love. So kudos to you for that. Um, very, like you said, entertaining, but also practical info. Um, and we'll for sure link your podcast in the show notes um, and also the YouTube channel channel as well. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk about your book. So I have it here, the resistance training revolution. Um, do you want to just give us kind of a background on, and you allude, alluded to this a little bit throughout your, your kind of evolution in the fitness industry, but why did you decide to write this book and who is it for? Um, I wrote the book for the average person, the average person, uh, and we'll just talk about America, right? The average person in America is probably struggling with some form of chronic health issue. The average person is uh, overweight or obese. Diabetes has been exploding. And a lot of these health issues associated with obesity um, are exploding. So we're in this kind of chronic health epidemic. 
And I wrote this book for those people. Now, why, uh, why just for them? Because a lot of the information that they've been you know, that they've heard or that they've read or seen on TV in regards to, you know, weight loss or fitness or improving their health. A lot of it is wrong. Um, I would venture to say at least 90% of the information that you get out there is wrong. And a lot of the right information isn't communicated properly or might even be stigmatized or stereotyped. For example, resistance training, also known as strength training or lifting weights or using resistance in a way to build strength and build muscle has been stereotyped as just a way to look like a bodybuilder or to build big muscles. It's never really communicated as an effective form of exercise to improve your health or to burn body fat or to optimize your hormones or for longevity. And the problem with that is when you actually look at the data, when you look at the studies, and again, I've seen this in my own experience training, you know, thousands of people over, over the last two decades is that in head to head competition, resistance training is actually the superior form of exercise and understanding the context of modern life. And the fact that we're not going to get people to work out every single day. That's just a, that's a dream. It's not going to happen. Life is sedentary. We've designed it that way. The most we could hope for is about two or three scheduled workouts a week. If people are consistent, um, that's, that's what we can hope for. And they're only going to pick one form of exercise. It would be great if people did lots of different forms of exercise, but if they only work out two or three days a week and they do it consistently and they're not fitness fanatics, it's probably only one. And the one form of exercise they should pick is resistance training, but it's not the one that we're told to do. It's not the one that we think we should do. Again, it's the one that's stigmatized. So I wrote this book to dispel a lot of those myths and to communicate the most effective way to, to combat these chronic health issues, which include obesity. And the reason why it's so effective is it requires the least amount of time and it teaches your body to do this on its own. And we can get into that a little deeper uh, into this you know, particular podcast, but I wanted to get it out there. And part of my inspiration was, uh, you know, ba back in the day, I believe it was in the seventies, there was a book called the complete book of running. And you've probably seen the cover. It's a, it's a, like a bottom leg and a red shoe. And it, everybody had it and it's sold millions of copies. That book was largely responsible for ushering in the, the running revolution. Okay? Prior to that book, not very many people ran outside. Unless you lived in Los Angeles, it would be weird to go outside your house and see people just running for exercise. Um, that book comes out and all of a sudden running shoes, you know, sales exploded and people started running for fitness and exercise. And I wanted to do something similar for resistance training. I wanted the average person to realize that, Hey, if I want to improve my health, let me go grab a pair of dumbbells or let me go do some body weight resistance training exercise because it's just so darn effective. So that was the goal. And again, it's for the average person. I didn't write it for mm -hmm. trainers. I didn't write it for fitness enthusiasts. I didn't write it for the fitness fanatic. I don't need to, to communicate to them how awesome resistance <laughs> training is. They already know it. I wrote it for my aunt and my neighbor and my cousin, you know, people who have no idea. And when they think about resistance training, they think of Arnold Schwarzenegger. They have no idea <laughs> that it's just this great longe this great form of exercise for health and longevity. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's really cool that you kind of are, you know, you picked that population because I feel like that is the population that that needs this and needs more just like, hey, here's like more of a practical kind of um not necessarily introductor, introduction, introduction. Wow, I can't tell the word introduction to resistance training, but kind of just busting all those myths that you mentioned. I know I actually gave my mom a copy of this book um, as well because she's kind of in that camp where she's actually you know just getting into resistance training, being you know in her sixties, and she's already seen tremendous changes over the past few years. Um, and and again, like after the age of sixty, still being able to change your body composition by just you know changing up her you know, instead of going to spin classes every four week or four days a week, she's switched that to actually training, um, a resistance training and has a trainer who's, who's taught her that. So it's been cool. It's been awesome to watch that. And I tell you, it's, it's no easy feat, right? Um, the average person, I mean, if we go back and we look at the original introduction of resistance training, at least to, through popular media, like the first movies that really showed it were like the the beach movies of the fifties and sixties. Uh, you know, these are the ones with, I don't remember their names, but there was like a couple, they, they, they were really popular and they do this dance, you know, and, and song combos and 
there'd be bodybuilders on the beach and they depicted these huge oversized bodybuilders as these big, dumb, you know, self-absorbed, arrogant kind of morons. And so that's what people thought. Oh, that's what happens. I guess that's the kind of people that lift weights later on. Um, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger is very, very charismatic individual who was Mr. Olympia bodybuilder. He comes out and kind of introduces more people to bodybuilding. But again, it's this big, extreme bodybuilder version of what can be accomplished through, you know, lots and lots of resistance training, of course, the right genetics and maybe anabolic steroids. People don't know that. <laughs> they think it's just lifting weights. And so it, that on top of action movies, on top of the fact that women, when the fitness industry realized that they were missing out on the largest consumer base in the world by not having women come work out in their gyms. This happened right around the 80s. Before that, gyms, like, you did not see women in gyms. Then in the 80s, gyms, they're like, we got to get women in here if we want to make any money. And what did they do? They sold women lies. I mean, they created words like toned. You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's an invented word that the fitness industry created to get women into the gyms who were afraid of looking like the bodybuilders that they thought that they might, I don't want to look like that. Don't worry. You're not going to build muscle. You're going to tone. By the way, muscles don't tone. They build or they shrink. So that's all they do. And, and when they yeah. build, when they build to a small degree, they just feel tighter. And that's where that term comes from. And they told women, you know, only do aerobics, do, you know, 500 reps. You don't want to lift weights. You don't want to look masculine. You don't want to, you know, get too big as if that was something that is easily accomplished. And, you know, through all that, so through all of that, and then on top of it, you look at the scientific community, all of the studies that were done on exercise and health were always cardiovascular exercise. They never did any other form of exercise, let alone resistance training or strength training. The only studies you would see on strength training or resistance training were performance-based, maybe for Olympic lifters, uh, or maybe a little later on for other athletes like football players, but there were no studies on it. All the studies that showed that exercise benefits your health were surrounded around aerobic type activity. So when doctors saw these studies and said, wow, exercise improves your health, this is the form of exercise I should recommend. 30 minutes of vigorous cardiovascular activity, right? That's what we've all heard. So nobody yeah, knew, yeah. nobody knew. The best studies on resistance training and health really only came out the last maybe 15 or 20 years. And what they're showing is blowing the doors off of anything else. And again, we'll get into that later. But what it's showing is that not only is resistance training a great form of exercise, it's the best form of exercise when you look at pretty much any metric of longevity and health and even the cosmetic effects that people are so driven by, which I'm not going to pretend like people are, are, aren't motivated by that. It's probably the number one reason why people work out in the first place. Well, if you want to look good, uh, resistance training does that far better as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. I think, um, one of the things I wanted to dive into too, is kind of just like busting through a few of those myths that you mentioned in the beginning. And also just kind of the first, one of the main topics, you know, that in your book is, is really just trying to get across the point that resistance training does produce more kind of permanent longer term results versus if you were to do, you know, cardio or, um, some other form of, you know, circuit style, something that's not, you know, focused on resistance training, um, in terms of like endurance or whatever it may be, but what, can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? Like why does resistance training produce more permanent results? And is it something that has, um, like, is it a delayed gratification type thing that we need to be aware of? Or like, can you just kind of unpack that a little bit? Yeah, totally. That's a good question. So, uh, so let, let's go back a little bit. When the obesity epidemic really became, when it became a thing, when we named it and we saw, oh my gosh, people are just, we're gaining weight like crazy. This is causing lots of problems. It's an epidemic. Scientists said, okay. And doctors said, all right, here's the deal. In order to lose weight, you have to take in less calories than you burn or burn more calories than you take in, which is true. This is a fact, right? So it's a law of thermodynamics. So if you're eating 2000 calories, well, you got to burn more than that because those extra calories that you burn will hopefully get taken from body fat. This is how you end up losing weight. And they did that. And they said, that's very true. Okay. Now it's more complicated than that. Of course, what you eat make, determines how you feel. And then the way you burn calories, there's, there's, that's a whole nother issue, but that's, that is true. That's a true formula. And then what they did is they looked at the burn side, right? The burn calorie side of that formula. And they said, 
let's pick the form of exercise that burns the most calories. That makes sense. We want to do the one that just burns the most calories. Now, the problem with that is the, of all of the things that exercise does, the least important, the, the, fa- the one factor that means the least, believe it or not, is the calories burned while performing that form of exercise. That actually means almost nothing. Now, here's why. Because there's a couple of reasons why. One, the body adapts to the calories that you burn while you're active. Okay, there was a really, really interesting study that was done on modern hunter-gatherers. There was a tribe called the Hadza tribe in northern Tanzania. And they live like we did, you know, 20, 30, 100,000 years ago, like hunter-gatherers. So they don't have TVs and, and cell phones. They, they're moving constantly. They hunt their food. They'll throw a spear at an animal. They'll wound it. They'll chase it down for miles until it gets exhausted. They'll, they'll gather berries and roots and stuff. And they're just moving all the time, right? And so scientists went down and said, all right, let's figure out how many calories they're burning through very sophisticated technology. Don't just guess, but let's actually measure their metabolic rate and how many calories they're burning. And what they found at the end of the study was that these these Hadza tribes people, they burned roughly the same amount of calories as the average Western couch potato. And they, at first it was like, this, this is crazy. How can they burn? Not, how can they not burn more calories than the average person that sits on their couch all day long? But then when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Evolutionarily speaking, if a hunter gatherer was burning 10,000 calories a day, they would have never survived. It is so hard to come by food as a hunter gatherer that our bodies evolved to become extremely efficient with certain types of activity, okay? Namely, cardiovascular activity, which is most of what hunter-gatherers do. So let's go back again. Let's look at, rather than look at how many calories exercise burns, let's look at the adaptations that exercise induces in the body. In other words, what does it do to my body, and then what does that mean? Forget the calories burned. How does my body change according to this exercise? And then what are the results of that? Okay, so if we look at the form of exercise that burns the most calories, which I said was not important, very easily that's cardio. Okay, Running will burn more calories in an hour than any other form of exercise. What happens, however, when you run is you're building endurance and stamina. That's the main adaptation, right? So when you first go run, you run a block, you're exhausted, but then you get better and you run two blocks and then three blocks. And then before you know it, you can run miles. It doesn't require much strength at all. In fact, it requires very little strength. It just needs endurance. This is why endurance athletes don't have very much muscle. You just don't need lots of muscle. You just need lots of endurance and stamina. And you're burning a lot of calories while you're doing it. So what your body does is it starts to adapt. And part of the adaptation is to slow down its metabolism in order to offset the calories burned while that activity is being done. And so your body pairs muscle down. Now, studies confirm this. When people diet plus cardio exercise to lose weight, generally speaking, roughly half of the weight that's lost is muscle. So if you lose 10 pounds, right around five pounds of that is muscle. Now, here's the problem with that. You're smaller, but you're right around the same body fat percentage you were before. And because you have less muscle, you have a slower metabolism. Muscle is a very metabolically active tissue. It's expensive to maintain in comparison to body fat, which is very cheap to maintain. doesn't require much energy to maintain fat, but muscle, it requires much more energy. This is why when people do lots of cardio as part of their weight loss approach, they initially see this kind of fast weight loss, and then they plateau real hard. And then they're left with this dilemma. I need, if I I want to lose 30 pounds, I've only lost 10 pounds. Okay. I want to lose more. I'm doing three days a week of cardio, plus I'm dieting. I need to either eat less or do more cardio or both. And then they do that. And then they do it again. Oh, I lost another 10 pounds, plateaued again. Okay, I got to eat less and I got to do more cardio. Oh, great. I hit my 30 pound weight loss goal. However, now I'm eating very little and I'm working out a lot. And if I stop any of that, all the weight's going to come back. And even worse, I'm not going to gain that muscle back that I lost. I'm probably going to gain back body fat. So now I'm left with a slower metabolism. In modern societies, having a metabolism that burns more calories is a tremendous benefit. It's one of the greatest buffers you can have against chronic disease. In fact, even if you eat, and I'm not advocating for this, but even if you eat 
a diet that's made up of quote unquote unhealthy foods, uh, processed foods, Twinkies, Cheetos, pizza, whatever. Even if your calories are low, a great deal of the negative effects from those foods is erased simply because you're burning more than, than you're taking in. So when you speed up the metabolism, now that calorie out portion really goes up. So how do we speed up the metabolism? All right, enter resistance training or strength training. It's true that you don't burn a ton of calories while you're lifting weights or doing body weight resistance training exercises. However, the primary adaptation of that form of exercise is to get stronger and to build muscle. The direct result of that is a body that requires more calories to sustain. So you slowly, but very consistently, speed up your metabolism. Studies show that when resistance training is the primary form of exercise in a weight loss program, no muscle is lost. Muscle is gained. So here's what weight loss looks like in that scenario. Starts off a little slower on the scale, maybe because you're building while you're losing. However, it starts to accelerate as the metabolism gets faster and faster. And if you do it right and you lose your 20 pounds at the end of it, you very likely can end up with a metabolism that burns more calories at the end than you did at the beginning. In other words, you were eating, I don't know, let's say you're eating 2,000 calories a day before. Now you lost 20 pounds and you're eating 2,500 calories a day. You're eating more than you did before to maintain your lean, leaner body. Um, so that's uh, one of the, the biggest and most profound effects of resistance training is that faster metabolism. Now there's much, much more that it does for you. But I think that's the big one because if people understood that rather than burning calories manually, they could teach their body to burn it automatically. I think they would see that that's a much more sustainable and permanent approach. It doesn't require more and more activity. It's your body doing it on its own. Now mm -hmm. to add to that in terms of the permanence of results, here's the beauty of building muscle. When you build muscle, you also build what's called muscle memory. And this is well documented in studies. It's 100% it's true. This is not my own anecdote. But when you build muscle, if you ever lose it in the future, you'll gain it back much faster than it took you the first time to build it. So if somebody's watching this or listening to this right now and you've ever broken an arm or a leg and you've had a cast on it, you take the cast off, you see how skinny that leg is and then how quickly that muscle comes back. That's muscle memory. So if you gain six pounds of muscle in a year of exercise, which you're not going to get bigger, six pounds of muscle, but you will feel tighter and you will have a much faster metabolism. And then let's say you stop working out and you lose all six pounds, you'll gain it back in a fraction of the time it took you the first time. So it's much more permanent results versus the other approaches, which require you to keep moving in order to gain those effects. And the second you stop moving, then forget about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I love how you put that, especially within like the modern world and our access to just food left and right and an abundance of calories is just so important to kind of switch your mindset in that regard. Can we chat a little bit about, and this will kind of play into it nicely from what you just mentioned, but kind of talking about um, kind of going back to longevity and aging side of things with uh, building muscle and, and resistance training can we chat about how like resistance training is, and a lot of people refer to it as kind of like the fountain of youth, like to, you know, help you maintain your, your youth as you age and just the importance of that. Are there, is there any specifics that you can dive into with that? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, let's talk about hormones. Okay. Um, there are what would be characterized as youthful levels of hormones. And then there's hormones that you may characterize as, uh, you know, being attached to somebody who's much older, right? So in men, for example, we'll see higher testosterone levels when they're younger. And as they age, testosterone levels tend to decline. In women, estrogen and progesterone changes. The balances change as they get older. And growth hormone in both men and women lowers as we get older, right? When you're doing resistance training, because the primary adaptation is a positive pro-tissue adaptation, in other words, the main adaptation is telling my body to build this positive metabolically active tissue, namely muscle. Because that's happening, in order to do that, my body will situate or organize its hormones in a way to make that happen. Okay, so what do we see in the studies? It's resistance training is one of the most reliable natural ways to raise testosterone in men. In fact, you see testosterone going up in all men whether their testosterone is low or high or in the middle, 
just by doing resistance training, we see those levels uh, pretty consistently go up. We also see the androgen receptors that testosterone attaches to. So imagine if testosterone is a key and then there's a lock that it needs to unlock and that's what makes it do its thing. Those locks increase in number. So those androgen receptors increase in density through resistance training. Growth hormone rises in both men and women. They, that's the hormone that they may call the, the, the fountain of youth hormone or the youth hormone in general. In women, we see balancing estrogen and progesterone. Because you're asking the body to build more muscle, because it's more metabolically active, these youth hormones have to uh, improve or increase or balance out in order to make that happen. So you're literally telling your body, I need more youthful hormones in order to make that happen. So it's a, it's a tremendously powerful way, natural way of doing that. Insulin. Insulin is a, is a very important hormone, right? Insulin resistance or your body's inability to react to insulin. If it gets real bad, that becomes diabetes, right? But even before you get to diabetes, insulin resistance contributes to inflammation, premature aging. It can contribute to chronic health issues. Some scientists say that things like Alzheimer's and dementia, they'll call it type three diabetes because it's related to our insulin resistance and our inability to utilize glucose for energy. Muscle is a very insulin sensitive tissue. It not only is it insulin sensitive, but it also helps your body store carbohydrates and sugar. So the, 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 the main organ that stores carbohydrates is the liver, but some of it's also stored in muscle. So you build a little, bu a little bit of muscle, you improve its capacity to store carbohydrates. And of course, carbohydrates are what insulin tell to kind of get shuttled into the body and whatnot. And that's what spikes insulin, right? When you eat sugar and carbohydrates. In fact, studies will show that even obese people, severely obese people, if they build muscle and don't lose any body fat. So even if they change, they, their body fat percentage stays the same and they just gain a little bit of muscle, we see improvements, quite dramatic improvements in insulin sensitivity. So those are some of the reasons why it promotes kind of this youthful, uh, you know, health uh, within your body. But again, there's even more than that. Um, if you look at, you know, towards the end of my personal training career, I trained a lot of people in advanced age. It was, it became one of my specialties. I enjoyed doing it. I love working with people, you know, over the age of 60. And one thing that you notice with them is loss of mobility, loss of balance, and in really bad cases, uh, bone mass loss and maybe even breaking bones or injuring themselves. You know, there's a saying in medicine where an elderly person will break their hip and then die of pneumonia. Like it's a big deal, right? If you're older and you break a bone or you injure yourself, the health decline from there tends to be pretty dramatic. Now, why do they, why do they, why do they lose their balance? Why do they lose their stability? They're not strong. That's the number one reason, by the way. If you lose strength... Mm -hmm you're unstable. If you're not strong, then stepping off something that you weren't accounting for, you're walking, and, oh, oh, there's a step. If you're not strong, you'll, you'll, you'll lose your stability and lose your balance. And anything that builds muscle also builds and strengthens bone. Muscle anchors at bone. In fact, it's the only form of exercise. There is no form of exercise that reliably increases bone density like resistance training. It's so, there's nothing that comes close to it. So if you look at all the things that affect us as we get older, resistance training combats all of them uh, directly. It's incredibly effective. And you don't need to do it all, much of it, you know, a couple days a week mm -hmm. of resistance training. Because remember, the, because it's not really about the calories that I'm burning while I'm moving. It's just, am I sending the signal to my body to change? You don't need to do a lot of it in order to do that. Two days a week for most people is plenty to get all of those health benefits. Now, if you want to look like a bodybuilder or get to those extreme <laughs> levels, then you may need to train much more. But for the average person, two days a week, even in three days a week is about it. Two to three days a week would be, would give you everything that you wanted. Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, one of the things that I, especially like in the female population within resistance training, we talked a little bit about that in the beginning. And I work with a lot of female clients. Um, there's a lot of convincing of, you know, focusing on not, well, not focusing on like the calories burn that your Apple watch is t telling you or the Fitbit. And we kind of know that the research continues to come out on how inaccurate those are um, in terms of the calories expenditure of that. Um, and then obviously we don't want to focus on that really when we're, when we're talking about resistance training, but when it comes to actually like putting in the 
effort um, when you are lifting weights and like actually, especially for females, like lifting heavy weights versus, you know, we've seen years ago, not so much anymore, but years ago, like the commercials of, you know, the, the pink dumbbells, people always refer to those and, you know, women should be using pink dumbbells and whatever. Can you chat a little bit about that and like the importance of kind of the intensity of how, you know, how heavy you're lifting and why it matters to continue to progress with that and to actually maybe, especially for females, not fear, you know, lifting heavier weights and, and maybe talk about a little bit about what you alluded to earlier about like how it's so hard to actually quote unquote, get bulky by just lifting weights. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that. So the, the two main reasons why I think uh, the average woman may be afraid to train heavy is one, they are, they, they, they falsely believe that resistance training will make them look bulky or manly or overly muscular. Okay. This will not happen. In fact, I could take 10 women off the street and I could train them like bodybuilders for five years. And the most I'll probably accomplish is a very lean sculpted physique. The women that you see that do look overly muscular and really crazy looking represent such a small minority of the types of genetics that you need in order to build that kind of muscle. To give you another example, how many people in everyday life have you seen that are over seven feet tall? Like think about your entire life. Have you ever seen anybody in everyday life that's over seven feet tall. Yeah, nope. probably, <laughs> probably, probably never or once. And you'd remember like, oh, I remember there was this one time at the airport. There was a guy and it was like seven feet tall. And I remember him because it was so rare. Right now, when you if you're always watching NBA games, you probably think it was super common, but it's super, super rare for people to be that tall. There's a, a, a kind of a genetic spectrum when it comes to height. And most people are somewhere in the middle, the vast majority of us. Okay. There's also a genetic spectrum when it comes to your ability to build muscle. Vast majority of us are in the middle. Very, very, very small percentage of us are way over on the extreme where we can work out and we just pile the muscle on our bodies. If this is you, I, you probably already know. You probably already know this is you. You probably <laughs> don't even work out and people walk up to you and go, oh my gosh, your biceps are massive. And you're like, I don't even exercise, right? So, <laughs> so, and that, so it's not going to happen. You could train as hard as you want. It's not going to happen. The second reason that you see this with women sometimes besides genetics is a lot of these, these, these bodybuilders, these female bodybuilders are on anabolic steroids. They're taking male hormones in order to look that way. So it's just not going to happen. And even if it did happen, it wouldn't happen overnight. So even if you were this genetically gifted individual or whatever, you could work out and within a certain period of time, you'd look in the mirror and be like, this is about as sculpted as I want to get. In which case I'd say, all right, back off on your training, go a lot easier and just maintain. Mm -hmm. So not a problem. Don't worry about it whatsoever. And also consider this muscle is very dense. It takes up about two thirds of the space that body fat does when you're, when they're equal weight. In other words, five pounds, if I were to take 10 pounds of body fat off someone and replace it with 10 pounds of muscle, they'd be much smaller, two thirds smaller, but they'd be mm -hmm. tighter and more sculpted because muscle of course is very firm, very tight. It gives you curve. When women talk about curve, they're talking about their butt and their hamstrings. Well, that's muscle. That's all muscle. The butt builds and so the hamstrings that gives you that, that kind of curve. So that's the, the main reason. The other reason is, I think societally speaking, and I know uh, hopefully this is changing a little more now, but I know my generation was true. Women were never or girls were never encouraged to lift anything heavy. Uh, it was scary. Don't do it. You'll hurt yourself. And so women are just not confident in picking heavy things up or, or doing things with a lot of weight. And it feels like it's kind of scary. By the way, heavy weight is all relative. So mm -hmm. I don't care how strong you are or how weak you are, what you're going to work out with will be appropriate for you. So you're not going to train with something that's inappropriate. So forget that. But I think it's just the, the feeling of pushing heavy weight is more foreign than the feeling of pushing cardio. Like if you, the average woman might be like, oh yeah, I know what it's like to get really tired running because I've done that before. But you ask them if they've ever done a heavy set of squats for six reps and many of them might not have ever done it. And there's another third reason. I'll throw one, one more in there. Women are, are definitely, and I'm going to generalize, tend to be much more conscientious than men. When I get a client, uh, when I would get a male client, that's the person that I would typically have to tell to, lift lighter. Like, listen, your form is off. You need to go a little lighter. Female <laughs> clients were always like, is my form perfect? Should I go lighter? 
So there's also that, that bit of a tendency. Now, why is heavy training so important? Okay. You have to train for what you want. If you want strength, which is what we want, when we're training for those benefits of resistance training that I talked about earlier, the way you get them is through strength. You get stronger. So the way to train for strength is literally lifting things that are heavy, doing anywhere between five to 25 reps with it. It's got to be challenging. So it's got to feel like somewhat of a struggle, although your form needs to be perfect. That's very important. Um, and you need to rest in between sets. The goal is not to s- exhaust yourself and feel like you're catching your breath or, or running out of your breath. It's, it's not that kind of a feeling. We're training for strength, not for that kind of endurance because we want the muscle, we want the strength, we want those positive hormone effects, and we want that metabolism boosting effect. So train for strength. You do your five to 25 reps at a good intensity with a weight that's heavy for you, but that's appropriate with perfect form. Do your set, rest for a couple of minutes, allow your heart rate to come down so that you can train for strength again. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious, what are your, what are your thoughts on like circuit style training, like orange theory, CrossFit, things like that compared to just kind of traditional, like hypertrophy bodybuilding style? Yeah. So just because you're holding dumbbells and a barbell or you're doing resistance training exercises doesn't mean you're doing resistance training. I keep, you know, circuit training, orange theory, that's cardio with dumbbells. It's cardio with weights. It's going from one exercise to another, no rest, you know, really breathing hard. It's like you're running. It's really no, it's really no different, maybe slightly different, but it's really no different to reap the real benefits of resistance training you got to train like you're building strength. That's the way you got to train. So it's like I said, you do a set, you rest, you a set. If you take the rest out, now it's just cardio uh, with weights. And you may, you're fooling yourself into thinking, you know, because I've talked to people and they say, oh yeah, I use weights. And then you look at the workouts. Well, you're actually doing cardio. You are using weights, but you're doing cardio. To be clear, resistance training in this, in the way that I'm communicating and with the benefits that I'm communicating is using resistance. By the way, resistance can be, body weight. It could be resistance bands. It could be machines. Of course, it could be free weights like dumbbells and barbells. It's using resistance in a way to specifically build strength and build muscle. That's the kind of resistance training that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think I fell into the camp of, I I did cross it for many, many years and I really loved, you know, the atmosphere. Um, But I, I saw the most difference in my body composition when I switched over or switched back to like kind of your bodybuilding style, just hypertrophy focus training. But I also think, you know, there's a, I think CrossFit and Orange Theory have their place for people who are just getting into it and they want that kind of extra push. Um, maybe they just, they just can't see themselves going to like an average gym and going through a program on their own. Um, but I think, like you said, if you want to kind of go to the next step, then really, you know, taking a step away from the circuit style training is going to be super important. Yeah. Um, and, and I do, I do want to be clear, Rachel, um, all forms of activity. I don't care what it is. So long as they're appropriate, because you can overdo anything or do anything wrong. All forms of activity done appropriately have health benefits and have benefits. So I don't want to discourage, like if someone's watching this right now and they're like, I, I hate resistance training. I love cycling. <laughs> and I've been cycling, you know, my, for, for 10 years and I love it and I do it right. And I don't beat up my body. Like, should I stop? No. Like, all forms of activity done properly and appropriately have health benefits. Okay. What I'm talking about is again, the average person is not going to do four or five different types of exercise. And the average person is not going to work out five or six days a week or seven days a week. They're going to do if we're lucky two days a week or three days a week, and they want to get the most bang for their buck. And they want to pick one form of exercise. Like which one should I do? Well, if that's you, then do resistance training. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Cool. Okay. So we have a few listener questions that I want to get to, um, before we run out of time. Um, okay. So the first one is, we'll just jump right into them. The first one is what are the, in your opinion, the best body weight exercises? Okay. So body weight resistance training exercises, uh, a squat is excellent. A lunge is amazing. A traditional, uh, sit up is really, really good for the core. 
push-ups, very good. And there's a lot of different kinds of push-up variations, by the way. So you have your, your traditional push-up with your, you're on your feet, you're on the ground, but if that's too hard for you, you could do it off your knees, or you could do it on an elevated surface, like a, a countertop or a chair. I like body rows a lot for the body. So it's almost like a upside down push-up. So I'd hold on to something, hang underneath it, mm -hmm. pull my body towards it so I can strengthen uh, my back. Um, and, and those are really some of the best ones. If you get some resistance bands, uh, you could do those exercises and a few others with resistance bands and you'd have a complete workout, a complete full body workout. In fact, in the book, I give people three workout routines and one of them only uses body weight in bands. So that's all you would need to perform one of the workouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, obviously during these times in COVID, I guess it's kind of hopefully at the tail end, but those are definitely very beneficial to kind of, I think everybody kind of had to like restructure the way that they were doing things and actually saw benefits from, you know, incorporating different, all different types of body weight exercises. I know I did. Um, I learned a lot from just like getting creative with things and there's just so many things that you can do if you, you know, have a little bit of creativity. So awesome. Cool. Okay. So next question, someone asked, does training fasted burn muscle? Yeah. Um, your body doesn't want to burn muscle. Even in the scenario that I talked about earlier, uh, where you, where they taught, where I talked about studies where people did cardio and dieted and lost muscle. It's not because the body's burning muscle. It's actually a terrible way to, to get fuel. Um, now it'll happen in extreme cases like extreme starvation. It'll start to happen where your body starts to eat away at muscle and organ. In those cases, your body's paring muscle down. So it's just, it's an adaptation. It's just reducing muscle so that you burn uh, less calories. No, you don't burn muscle while fasted. Um, now, uh, if you're an extreme fasted case, uh, you know, sense if you're fasted for 72 hours or longer or 48 hours, um, you probably don't want to work out very hard because it might not feel very good. But I work out fasted every morning. So every morning I wake up, I don't have breakfast until after my workout. So there's nothing wrong with, uh, with fasted training. There's even a myth that fasted training burns more body fat. Still not true. It's all, it's at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's all due to the, the calorie deficit that's at the end of the day. Um, so it's perfectly fine. It's totally up to personal preference. Some people enjoy working out where they have an empty stomach. They feel like they can perform better. I'm one of those people. Other people like to work out after they've been fed. That's probably most people studies show that eating something, you know, a couple hours before your workout will improve your performance. So it's all personal preference. Mm -hmm. And do you make sure that you get like a certain amount of nutrients in, like you mentioned, post-workout? Is there like a time? I know this is probably something you can debunk, but we know like the anabolic window, it's not really a window, it's a barn door. Maybe we can chat about that for a little bit, just because I know you, you mentioned you work out fasted. And so your opinion on that? Yeah, no. So post-workout, meaning right after you work out, if you consume carbohydrates and protein, uh, you'll utilize more of it and it, get into your muscles faster, all that stuff. I mean, there's a little bit of truth there in the grand scheme of things. We're splitting hairs. Doesn't make really that doesn't really make a difference. I mean, you'll 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 replenish your glycogen and your muscles will recover even if you eat three or four hours later. In some cases, you should not eat right after you work out. If you're somebody that suffers from gut health issues. Like if you're somebody with like IBS or, or maybe you're treating yourself for SIBO or you've got lots of food intolerances, you probably don't want to eat right after your workout because your body's in a bit of an inflamed state. Um, and that can encourage, uh, you know, things like leaky gut syndrome or more food intolerance. So you might actually want to wait uh, a few hours, but no, the reason why we've been told it's so important to eat right after you work out is because it's a really effective way of selling protein powder shakes. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you tell people, it's a very, it's very brilliant marketing. It's like, you have to eat protein right after you work out in order to ensure that your workout was effective. And then people are like, well, I'm at the gym. What am I going to eat? Like, oh, by the way, we have this convenient protein powder. Just drink this up and then you'll be totally fine. <laughs> but no, it's splitting hairs really doesn't, doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Would you say that, you know, someone who does train fasted that it's, it might be a little bit more advantageous to at least get a bolus of protein in within a few hours versus someone who have, would have eaten right before they trained? Do you think there is some importance there or is it still? I mean, it depends on the length. I mean, you said a few yeah. hours. I would say, yeah, if you're already fasted and then you worked out, you probably want to eat something within a few hours afterwards, but really leave it yeah. up to how you feel. I don't think it's a good idea to work out real hard and continue fasting. So in other words, like, oh, I'm planning a 72-hour fast. 
So on, you know, hour 24 or whatever, I do a really hard workout, but then I'm not going to eat still for two more days. Probably not a good idea. You, your blood pressure tends to get low when you're fasted and your, your, your blood sugar, some people's blood sugar might go down too low. So I don't, I don't think that's a good idea, but mm -hmm. no, I, I think people overcomplicate it when it comes to that. I, I, I think it, in extreme cases with super advanced athletes where every little, you know, every little micron makes a difference then maybe like if you train twice a day, uh, you know, if you're one of those athletes that likes to, you know, works out in the morning and then again, you know, a few hours later or whatever, then yeah, you probably want to eat in between, but no average person. It's, it's not a big mm -hmm. deal. Gotcha. Cool. Okay. So the last question we have here from a listener, we hear training to failure to failure often, but, oh, sorry. We hear that training to failure often is important, but what does it actually mean in practicality? Yeah, first of all, it's not important. Um, but what is train to failure? So train to failure means when you're doing an exercise, uh, in particular resistance training, when you're lifting a weight or doing an exercise, that you do it until you can no longer perform that exercise anymore. Okay, so if I'm doing a curl and I get to rep number 10, and then 11 and then 12. And it's like, oh my God, I barely get it up. And then I know I can't do another one. I failed. That means training to failure. Now, the reason why that got popular was because the question will arise, well, how hard do I do it? And so the answer was, well, if you go to failure, you've gone hard enough because you can't do anymore, right? But here's what studies show. Studies show that that's way too much intensity for most people. It actually slows down progress because it requires too much too many resources and too much recovery. Remember your body, when you're the reason why your body changes through exercise is because your body's adapting to a stress. All exercise is a stress on the body. In fact, if scientists were to analyze you while you're working out right after, and we didn't tell them that you were working out, they would look at it and go, this person was under stress. Like what was happening to them? Like, oh, they were running or they were working out. Like, oh, okay, this makes perfect sense. So what your body does is it adapts so that next time the same insult doesn't cause the same amount of stress. But then of course, what do you do? You, you get stronger, you add weight, you make the workout harder and you continue that, that progress. Now recovery is not the same as adaptation. Okay. Recovery is healing. Adaptation is going above and beyond that. So it's like, if I, if I rub my hand with sandpaper and I rub the skin down a little bit, and then I let the skin heal and then it develops a callus to protect itself. The callus would be the adaptation. The healing part is just recovery. Failure places too much emphasis on recovery. It doesn't allow for as much adaptation. So studies show that going to failure for most people actually slows down. It's too hard. It fries the body. It's way too hard. So I like to tell people to stop about three reps or so before they fail. So stop when you think you can maybe do three more reps. Now, I'm going to take that even a step further. For the average person, and that's for the fitness fanatic, for, by the way, for the, for the person who's been working out for a while, that's what I'll tell them. Stop about two or three reps short of failure. Well, what about the person who's never done resistance training or the person who's listening to this and they do, oh, I do other forms of exercise, but I've never really done resistance training. Here's what I like to tell them. Practice your exercises. Don't treat them as workouts. So what does that mean? That means that if you're doing squats, don't think to yourself, I'm going to get my legs tired and sore. Think to yourself, I'm going to practice squats until I get really good at them. And my form is absolutely perfect. That will get you better results in the long term than constantly training for intensity. Treating it like a skill that you're practicing will get you far better off than, you know, always thinking about hammering the body or beating up the body part that you're training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like that. I think, you know, there is confusion, you know, when it comes to training to failure or training close to failure and things like that. But I think, like you mentioned, for someone who is just starting off, um, it's probably the, the execution of that exercise is going to be a lot more important for your long-term results versus trying to, you know, you know, work, I don't know, harder, I guess you could say within that intensity. So awesome. Cool. I, I have a question for you. We have a few more minutes. I, um, what is your personal, and this is some, someone actually had a question that was similar to this, one of the listeners, but what is your personal um, kind of nutrition and training look like on a daily basis? Like if we, if you were to take us to like one of your average days, um, we, we kind of talked about in the beginning, you train in the morning, but like, what does your nutrition look like for you throughout the rest of the day to support that training? No. So usually I'll start my day off with a bowl of lucky charms. I think that's, a, I'm just kidding. I don't, 
I, I, I generally stay away from uh, heavily processed foods. Generally, heavily processed foods to come in wrappers and boxes and bags. And, and it's not necessarily because they're not as healthy, although typically they're not as healthy, but rather because they've been engineered to make you overeat. And, and studies actually show this quite clearly that the average person will eat about five or 600 more calories a day just because they're eating heavily processed food because of the way they're engineered. Like for example, a big family size bag of Lay's potato chips contains like five potatoes in there. It's really hard for me to eat five plain boiled potatoes, but I could eat a whole bag of Lay's potato chips. No problem. So I generally avoid heavily processed foods. I tend to prioritize proteins and fats. They're essential. Those are the things we have to eat because our bodies can't produce certain types of fatty acids and it can't produce certain types of amino acids. Um, and I eat carbohydrates based off of my activity level. So I'll eat more based on more activity, less if I have less activity. My staples tend to be beef, lamb, chicken, uh, eggs, sometimes fish. Um, I like sardines quite a bit, very good source of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And they're really, uh, I like the way they taste. Sources of carbohydrates tend to be rice, sweet potato, potato, squash. Not the one that you told me about earlier. I want to try that one, but just regular <laughs> spaghetti squash. Vegetables tend to be things like asparagus, uh, broccoli. I like, although I don't know if it's a vegetable. I think it might be a fruit, cucumber, uh, zucchini. Mm -hmm. um, I like avocado quite a bit. I use olive oil uh, quite a bit. My training, I tend to work out about five to six days a week. And it depends. I mean, you could at any given moment you ask me, it'll probably look different. But right now I'm just alternating between an upper and lower body workout. So Monday upper, Tuesday lower, and I go all the way through the week, uh, probably until um, Sunday. And I put a special emphasis on compound uh, type lifts. I like compound lifts. Um, I'll throw in some correctional exercise in there. These days, I don't train as heavy as I used to. Um, I noticed that pushing my body with with heavier and heavier weight. Now I've gotten to a level where I can get really strong, which is cool. But if my form is off a little bit, then the, I tend to feel it. And the, you know, I haven't, I don't injure myself very often. It's quite rare, but I'll feel my joints get a little stiff or a little achy. So these days it's much lighter, much more concentrated, slower and controlled. Um, and that's uh, pretty much it. And then I, I like to walk. I try to, I try to walk a few times a day. Um, just to get myself to be active uh, throughout the day. Awesome. Love it. Um, I do have, so one more question before our, our final question. So I do have a lot of um, people who listen to this podcast who are in that lower carb space or coming from a lower carb ketogenic space, uh, which was where I was at for, for many years. And I kind of transitioned uh, more back into the balance side of things really with, that's why the podcast is called Metflex and Chill Metabolic Flexibility. Um, so what is your opinion and just kind of your experience potentially with a uh, ketogenic or a low carb diet? I know there's a lot of people have lots of different opinions on these. And so I'm just curious at your experience with that. Well, the first thing I want to say is that there's a pretty wide individual variance when it comes to, um, nutrition. There really is. I, I've just learned this through the years that I've, I've trained people. I, I mean, I'll never forget. I had a client once I, I was vehemently opposed to a pure vegan diet. Um, if you look at the studies, if you look at the nutrients that are available, it's very hard to get all the nutrients that you need. You have to combine the right foods. You have to be very educated. Um, you know, you, you, you've got all your essential nutrients and very, you know, one piece of meat will have it. And, you know, we evolved eating meat and blah, blah, blah. I can make all the arguments. Right. So I was very <laughs> against veganism, uh, you know, unless people did it for moral reasons. Well, anyway, I had a client once and we just, you know, he, he was improving and, you know, he was following the nutrition that I advised and we exercised. And then he was a, a surgeon and he used to do this uh, once a year, he would volunteer his time and he'd go to other places in the world and volunteer his services. And he went to this far you know, part of the world where um, he had to live with this, 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 this tribe essentially. And he ate pretty much all vegetable based foods. This tribe was poor. Meat was very expensive for them except for the occasional piece of fish, they mainly ate like vegetables. Uh, and so he did that and he came back and he's like, man, I feel great. And I still argued with them. And, and finally I said, why don't we try it and then see what happens? And he felt amazing. And I said, like, you know, 
you know, stupid me, of course, because there's such an individual variance to how our bodies can respond to now there's general rules. Like you don't want to overeat. Overeating is bad no matter what, but there is an individual variance when it comes to nutrition. So let's talk about keto or low carb for a second. Are there going to be people that are just healthier and feel better and more vibrant eating that way? Absolutely. There definitely will be. Um, pr- usually it's people with gut health issues. In my experience, I think people with gut health issues tend to do better with lower carbohydrates, maybe people with maybe insulin sensitivity issues uh, can sometimes do better on those. I know people with cognitive decline tend to do better on ketogenic diets. I know it's, it, it can, it's shown improvements with people like with dementia and, and Alzheimer's. Um, but aside from that, generally speaking, it has no additional benefit. Unless you're one of those individuals that just, like I said, there's that variance. It really has no additional benefit to other healthy you know, ways of eating. And in fact, it may have some, some problems too low of a carbohydrate diet for too long. For some people can cause thyroid issues. It can cause hormonal issues. Uh, you see this more often in women than you see in men, although men sometimes can see low testosterone from being ketogenic, uh, for too long. Um, if you follow this diet and you do it right and you feel good, then that's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. You probably want to pay attention to your sodium. You're going to need a lot more of it. If you're eating this way, people with but because your body holds less water, you know, you'd be surprised how many people on low carb diet just feel incredible once they add sodium mm-hmm. to their diet. So that's, that's something to take, to, to keep in mind. But most diets that give you the essential nutrients, macro and micronutrients that are whole based foods, they're probably okay. Um, and when we look at the individual variants, pick the one that works best for you. And, you know, to comment on that, there's also the psychological uh, effects that we don't want to discredit. You know, you may have certain attachments to certain foods, or you may like eating a particular way because you like those. You may love fat and protein and carbs are like whatever. So I'll just cut them out. It's an easy way for me to cut calories. Like that's a very, that's a very valid reason for eating that way. So, mm-hmm. um, but again, removing an entire macronutrient out of your diet is going to complicate your life a bit, especially living in the world that we do where food is so available and so abundant and every event has food, you know, I mean, you might be okay being that person who's like, no, I can't eat this. I can't eat that. (laughs) Uh, But so consider those things, I would say. Yeah, for sure. I agree. It's super individualized. And I think it all depends on, you know, the person where they're coming from and what their particular goal is, you know, at that, that period of time. So awesome. Cool. Okay. So I always end with this question. Um, So is there anything that you've changed your mind about in the last year and why? Okay. So, so I knew I was going to ask, answer this question. So I hope you don't mind if I change it a little bit because something came to mind when you said that, and it's, it hasn't been over the last year. It's been more the last two years that I really changed my mind on, uh, on, on, and that is the importance of a spiritual practice for health. Um, I, in, in, you know, this is just something you'll see with people who've been pursuing health and fitness for a long period of time. They'll exhaust all the all the components and eventually you're left with purpose and meaning and, you know, the spiritual side of things. And it's just as important for health as exercise and diet. And this isn't just my opinion. This is backed up by lots and lots of scientific studies uh, on it. And so I, I mean, I used to be an atheist and now I'm not. And I realize the, the value and benefit of spiritual wisdom and spiritual practice in health. And I'm a newbie. I'm a total beginner with it. So, uh, I'm not great at it. It's not, uh, something I'm super dip- disciplined on yet. But if you had asked me a few years ago, if I thought a spiritual practice was a very important component when it came to health, I would have said no. And, uh, now I, I realize just how wrong I was. Is there anything like what, like, what have you been, I guess, working on the past year in terms of that? Like, is there anything you do on a daily basis that you found, you know, changed your perspective on things or just trying to kind of changed your life in that sense? Yeah. Um, years ago we had, uh, a Bishop Barron on the podcast. He's a Catholic Bishop and he's a uh, popular on social media and YouTube and he great communicator. And I had him on the podcast cause I thought he was just so good at communicating. And at the time I had no interest in Christianity or Catholicism, but a lot of the wisdom that he espoused was, uh, quite mind blowing. I, I would hear the way he would communicate things. It was really, really good. And it, it kind of broke through you know, some of my barriers and it wasn't the mysticism. It wasn't any of that stuff that took much later, but 
it was a lot of the other stuff that he was talking about. Um, like, like an example would be, um, this, this was really profound for me, but he said uh, something along the lines, he didn't say exactly like this, but something along the lines of, we all worship something. And I thought, well, I mean, atheists don't worship anything. And he said, well, no, your top value is what you worship. So wh whatever the top value you have, your entire life tends to be driven towards that. And what tends to happen when it's not, in his, case, in his example, when you're not worshiping God, you tend to worship material things uh, like money, or you tend to worship pleasure or power or honor. And it really blew me away because I thought, immediately I thought of all the celebrities that I know of that have you know, committed suicide or overdosed or, you know, and you think these people have everything. They have all the money, they have all the sex, they have all the whatever they could want. And yet they, you know, they were unhappy. Um, and so he explained that. I thought that was really interesting. And if you look at the major spiritual uh, religions or the, the major religions of the world, they all echo that. They all say that, uh, that, that, that those material things be careful because you'll worship them. So I thought that was very interesting. Oh, okay. So what's a, a practice of mine? Prayer. Prayer now is a practice. Mm -hmm. uh, Arthur Brooks, a good friend of mine, says that he's an expert on happiness. He studies it. He teaches it. Um, he's a Harvard professor. And he said that you need to have kind of this practice that allows you this 10,000 foot view of things. So it's like you're in life, you're in it, you're living it, you're doing it. But then once a day, you know, take a 10,000 foot view of everything and look at the bigger picture. And it puts in, it really does put things in perspective and kind of changes uh, how you react to certain situations. Yeah, that's super insightful. I feel like for myself, like meditation has been one of those things that over the past like two years I've been up and down with, but every time I kind of get into a groove, it, it like makes a difference after a little while. And you, you kind of, you you realize like, okay, I actually need to be doing this on a daily basis. Cause it, it grounds me and it makes, you know, you aware of so many other things that you're just, you know, so it, it within life, it's just, everything's like, go, 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 go. And so taking a step back, whether it's prayer or meditation or anything like that, I think it's super important and super underrated, especially. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And a big, a big thing for me was I, I, you know, like with meditation, I thought I'd do it and I'm like, well, I don't, all right, I don't get it. And I wouldn't do it anymore. <laughs> and then somebody told me, they're like, dude, it's like exercise. Like the first time you exercised, were you good at it? And I'm like, well, no, oh my God, I got to practice it. You're right. And they're like, yeah, you got to practice. It's like anything you got to do it and get good at it. So don't just do it once or do it for a week or a month, like keep doing it. And like exercise, you, you develop those muscles and you get, you get better at it and you mm -hmm. reap more benefits. So I thought, okay, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that's a good way to wrap it up, especially, you know, with resistance training, something you have to, like you mentioned, you have to practice, you have to, you're not going to be good at it at first, but just continue to do it. And I feel like anybody that I've ever trained or talked to, like the first, you know, when they first start to get into it, it's like intimidating. Right. And they're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And then like, you actually start looking forward to it after you, like, for example, my mom, she's like, oh, I don't want to do this. This is like weird. And now she's like, every time I see her, I'm in person with her. She's like, Hey, let's, let's go, let's go to your gym. Let's go lift some weights. I'm like, all right, mom. <laughs> That's great. Great. So, Good for you. Good yeah. for her. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, do you want to tell our listeners or viewers where they can find you? Um, obviously your podcast, um, website, social media, all that jazz. Yeah. So mind pump is the podcast. Um, we have YouTube channels. We have two of them. One is a podcast and one is for fitness videos. If you just go, if you just YouTube mind pump, you'll see them both. And then the book, the resistance training revolution, you can find that anywhere that books are sold, or you can go to the resistance training, training revolution.com. Awesome. I will link all of those in the show notes so people can check them out. All right. Thank you so much for your time. It was fun chatting with you. Thanks, Rachel. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Metflex and Chill. I hope you enjoyed it. It would be awesome if you could give the show five stars and leave a review on iTunes. We're trying to get placed in the top 100 health podcasts and the five star ratings and reviews are what can help make that happen. I'll add step-by-step -step directions for leaving a review in the show notes. I know it's a big ask, but it really helps. Thanks again. See you next time.